So, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our third uh, lecturer of the school, Torfin Corneliusen from the University of Copenhagen. And uh, we are very excited to listen for your today's lecture. Yeah. Okay, so I, I uh, well, thank you very much, Vladimir. Uh, I'm glad, glad to, to participate in this. So uh, on the Zoom window, I've actually put all the slides for the first part that I'm going to talk about. Today, I'll have two slideshows. This first one will be all around uh, ancient DNA. But, but please open this on, on your own computer if, if you want to go back to, a, to some of it, if you think I'm moving too fast or, or, or too slow. So I'll try to share my screen here. Okay, so can everybody see this? I remember the last time I had some problems with the, uh, with it. Sure, sure. Oh, sure. Okay. okay, can you also see the mouse move around? Yep. Okay, fantastic, glad to hear. Okay, so I'm an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen at the health faculty at the institute that is called the GLOBE. And I am, um, uh, my research is uh, evolving around the, the development of uh, mathematical and statistical methods in the form of programs that allows people to uh, analyze their genomic data. This has mostly been focused on uh, low coverage data for which ancient DNA is, uh, is, is a good example. So um, normally it, my work is, uh, is sitting in front of the computer and uh, and programming and writing up math. But the hosting institution that I have, this geogenetic center, the Lundbeck Foundation are the ones that are supporting it, is I think uh, one of the best places in the world for, uh, for sequencing ancient, uh, ancient DNA. And, and a lot of people uh, have a, like an um, almost morbid fascination of, uh, of dead DNA. So as an introduction to, to, to the next three session, I'll talk a, a bit about uh, what ancient DNA is, which should build on top of what uh, Ross talked about uh, the last three times, especially what, what the difference uh, is from ancient DNA and, and modern DNA. Okay, so, um, so after this uh, slideshow, I think you should be able to uh, characterize uh, what ancient DNA is and why this is difficult and why it is different with regards to modern data. This will especially roll around this thing about the, the libraries and the sequencing and then something which is called the complexity and the clonality and, uh, and, and depth of coverage, which is very, very important when you're working with ancient DNA. And I'll also talk about some of the different uh, methods that we are, um, that can be used different sequencing technologies we can use for generating the data. And, and I hope that after this uh, one hour presentation, I think you should be able to uh, understand the, the, the technical aspects, not the analysis part, but the technical aspect with regards to the data generation for, for any uh, article that is based on the analysis of, of ancient DNA. Okay, so this is a, a, a short one slide primer on, on uh, what the DNA is. And, and I think Ross and uh, Rasmus talked about this. So I, I, I'll just mention what, what, what I think is, uh, is, is important. So uh, on the left side here, we see like the first undisputable uh, evidence of, of, of DNA. This is a crystallography which is seen, I think it's from the top of this uh, double helix that we, is the way we normally visualize the DNA. This goes back from 1952. And they also um, mentioned that they assumed that it had, they actually used this uh, on the plate sentence that it, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. And I think in, this is uh, very, very underplayed, maybe may a bit arrogant also, 
because it, it is really the, the foundation for everything we're doing. But one thing that, that I think was um, surprising for me was that it was actually not Watson and Creek in 53 that uh, first came into contact with, um, with DNA. It was, goes all, all the way back to uh, 1869, a German a researcher called Friedrich Mirschner, I think it's, it's pronounced, he managed to isolate DNA, he called the, the, the nuclein, and he also stipulated that it was, um, that it was used as the basis for the, for the genetic information. And that was all the way back in 1869. So if we look at the, the double helix of DNA, then the red and the yellow part is the one that goes around this. It's a double helix that goes like this. This red and yellow part, we call this the, uh, the backbone. So uh, you have two strands, which are the backbones, and then what binds these strands together is this part here. I think Ross also talked about this, but I'll mention it again. If we observe a G on one strand, then what we have on the other strand is a C. If we have a C on one strand, then the opposite strand is, is, is an A, okay? So this is a basic uh, biology that, that everybody uh, should know. So how, how, are, how is, are the, D, the DNA organized? Well, there are fundamentally two parts of the of, uh, of, of genetic material in, in a human cell. There's the, uh, the, the nuclear genome. So if you have a, a cell in a higher organism, which we would call it like a eukaryote, then you have your cell. It has a cell membrane. Within the uh, cell membrane, that there's, uh, within the cell, there's a core, which we call the nucleus. The nuclear genome is what's inside the nucleus. And this exists in one copy. In the other place within the cell, but outside the, the nucleus, we call, this is the cytoplasm. And there we have the organelle genome, which is the, um, which is the, the mitochondrial the genome. And this exists in thousands and thousands of, of, of copies. So, so uh, especially within uh, ancient DA, mitochondrial, the mitochondrial genome ha has played a very, very uh, big role, mainly because it's, um, it's so short. Uh, a human genome is in the size of, uh, of gigabases, but the mitochondrial genome is only 16 kilobases. So it's, it's much, much smaller. And you have this in a much higher abundance within every cell. So it's easier to, uh, to sequence. Structurally, it's very different from the nuclear genome since it's, uh, it's circular. It's a circular genome. It, it also follows a different kind of, um, of pedigree since the, uh, you inherit this directly from your mother and solely from your mother. So uh, the mitochondria and all my cells is something that was given to me by, by my mother, right? The, the mitochondria in, in, my, in my father's genome is not something that, that I have. On this, um, a, a strange uh, or you know, interesting artifact with this mitochondrial DNA is that part of it, which is, is called the D loop, there it, you don't have two backbones, but you actually have a, a third strand, which kind of sips it up. So the, the repair mechanisms in that area becomes much more difficult and it becomes more var variable. We call this the hypervariable region of the, uh, of the mitochondrial genome. And with re regards to the, uh, to the genome sizes, higher organisms, the, the organisms that have cells with a, with a nucleus, we call those the eukaryotes, they, they have much larger genomes than bacteria, which are uh, cells that do not have this uh, nucleus. Bacterias are on the scale of one megabase to 10 megabases. Viruses are extremely small. So mammals, which we are normally focused on, on analyzing, um, are on, on the right range of, um, of, of six uh, gigabases. Of course, you, you have this, um, a, an important aspect here is that uh, we humans, we, we, we are deployed in the sense that we have two chromosome copies. We get a chromosome set from our father and a chromosome set for, for our mother. So the total genome is the sum of these. If you look at other organisms like amphibians and flowering plants, these have a much higher variability in their genome sizes. 
and this is due to uh, to, to varying ploidy levels, especially plants. They have, um, depending on which phase they have in the best state of their life they are in, then they have uh, different genome sizes. Okay, so so um, so that 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 was uh, how it, uh, what DNA is and, and how how it how it was organized. But but let, let, the focus here should be on the uh, on the ancient uh, DNA. So for, for living organism, there are all these uh, cell repair mechanisms. They, those are uh, processes that will, uh, if the, the cell gets damaged, it will try to repair it. If the DNA gets, uh, gets damaged, it will also try to repair it. As soon as uh, life ceases to, uh, well, as soon as life stops, then all these uh, repair processes cease to, uh, to, to function. So, here we have what is the representation of a very long uh, fragment of a genome, right? So this, if it was chromosome one from, from a human, it would be 256 uh, uh, megabases long. Then what happens when it, um, when it, uh, when it, when, when, when time goes on is that it will start to fragment. So this very long fragment will break into uh, two smaller parts. And as time goes on, as the years pass, then these two fragments will also break and it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is a, a completely st stochastic process. So, uh, so every fragment will, uh, will, will become smaller fragments through some uh, ra random process. There is some affinity with regards to, um, to where, where the break happens, but it's, it's not something that is uh, fully understood uh, yet. So if we are, um, if we are looking at something in physics like uh, radioactive decay, then we talk about a half-life. There's a kind of a similar thing you can do with the, the fragment length. If you look at an ancient genome and then you look at the, the mean size for, for all the fragments, then it will, will follow this kind of decaying uh, distribution. So this also means that as it gets older and older, the, the fragments get uh, smaller and smaller. This is why some movies like uh, Jurassic Park, where they find some, uh, some dinosaur blood in a, in a mosquito in, in amber, this is what will not happen because that, there might be DNA in it fr from the dinosaur, but it's so fragmented that it will be impossible to, uh, to stitch together into to a genome. On the right uh, figure here, then we, we're looking at the histogram of the, the read length. So we take all our, our reads, then we count how many times do we have serve a read length of 31, how many times do we serve a read length of, of 32, and then we can see that it follows this, um, this kind of, uh, of decaying distribution. One thing to notice here is that uh, we do not observe reads between 20 and uh, 31. So these would be fragments, the DNA fragments or reads that are smaller than, than, than 31. And this is uh, something we, we normally do with, uh, is that we, we cannot uh, map with high accuracy and precision, very, very short reads. So, we, uh, so there's, there's a many, many of these, these would be the large abundance of the reads, but, but we cannot use them for any uh, meaningful downstream analysis. So we, we normally discard those. Okay, so, so when that you have your, your, your molecules, your, your long fragment that will break, another thing that happens is that th there will uh, be damage. And in a DNA context, that means uh, damage means that it does something which is called deamination. Uh, cytosine uh, will, will, will be converted into a uracil. And when you do the, the sequencing, then the uracil gets interpreted into a, a T. Right? You have four bases, A, C, D, and T. So if you have damage, then Cs will turn into Ts. Okay? So, um, so, so if we are looking at this example, then we are, this is not two chromosomes. This is one chromosome. So this would be one back DNA associated with, with one backbone and then the other backbone. Then when, when it breaks, it will not be a clean cut. There will be a, an overhang. 
And this will normally be in, in the range of one to 25 base pairs uh, of your read. So uh, what we can do is to, uh, to do this kind of, uh, we can count how many times have a C turned into a, a T. We can do this for the first position of the read, for the uh, second position of the read, the third position, so forth. And this is what we see in the bottom part here. So this would be like the, the type specific errors for, uh, for the different position. How this is calculated, uh, I'll, I'll let that float for now. We might get back to it in some of the later sessions. But right now we are assuming that we just have this ability of figuring out when a C has turned into a T. When we are sequencing from one direction. On the other, um, if you're looking at it from the other end, from the other side, then we, we certainly see that a G turns into a, an, an A, right? So from when we're sequencing one direction, C turns into a T, from the other direction, a T turns into an A. And this is, uh, can, can be uh, super complicated uh, for the first time people see this. And even people have gone to the lab uh, sometimes get, gets confused about this because it's, it's, uh, it's a product of how we do the sequencing and, and how DNA polymerases work. So, so, so look, I'll explain this and then you can look at it and then you can uh, ask questions later on because it, it, it's, it's not really trivial. So here we have uh, one backbone from, from a DNA molecule and then the, the other strand, okay? So we have what was originally a C. We know that uh, a C due to this complement C, then what should be on the opposite strand is, is a G. But C gets turned into a U due to damage, okay? And a U, when we are doing the, the sequence, it get, gets interpreted into a T. And what is uh, complement to the T is, is an A. So what was originally a, a C, G turns into a T, A. Okay, so C turns into a T from one direction. If you're looking at it from, from the other direction, then we have the, the G on top, and then we originally had a, a, a C, and the C get turns into a U. And then the U turns into a T. And what is opposite of, of, of what should be complement to T is the A. So on, on, on from the other read, we have that um, a damage turns into a G into an A. Okay, so from what direction C turns into a T, from the other direction a G turns into an A. Okay, so... Um, so here is, um, so this is actually a very small exercise that uh, I think uh, you don't have to do any math, but it's just uh, about recapitulating uh, what, um, what I just said. So here we have two different samples and there are two different uh, summary statistics for these uh, samples. On the left side, we have the the, the read length distribution. And on the right side, we have this kind of uh, misincorporation uh, pattern. So, uh, just a second here. Um, sorry, it was my uh, wife that called me. Yeah, can, can you see this again? Yeah, sure, we can. Uh, okay, I, good, glad to hear. So take this and uh, figure out which one is uh, ancient. If you've been paying attention, it should be uh, relatively easy. And then secondly, there, there are some, some open questions. And it's uh, what factors affects the, uh, the rate of decay? And uh, how can damage actually be useful even though it modifies the, the DNA? And, um, and then in what location, region, in regions, environments, would you expect of good samples? And, and where would you predict the... Uh, problems. So uh, I've sent out the, uh, the slides so you can open those and look at the plots and these questions. And then I'll try to send you out in, uh, in this uh, breakout rooms. I'm not sure how we have, we have 17. So uh, what about uh, four breakout rooms, I think. 
and then you can discuss these things and then we will go into um then, then we'll go through through the answers to this let's see so i'm wondering where we have put people into breakout rooms here oh i guess i should make you the main host just a second Yes, now you should be able to do that. Okay, I'll try. Breakout rooms. Okay, so I'll create four breakout rooms. So there'll be four participants in a room. But I guess that Vladimir and me will not uh, uh, join a breakout room. So, so let's make three breakout rooms. We, we are not that, that many people. So discuss these things and then we'll uh, go through it. And I think we should take like, a, uh, let's see, 10, 10, 10 minutes and, um, and then we'll, we'll go through them, okay? Okay, so uh, I assume everybody is, uh, is back now. Um, so what uh, so which sample do you think that is uh, that is ancient here and which one is is modern the first one is ancient and second one is modern one yes and how can you see this uh so first of all uh, in case of first sample we have this uh, can you hear me yes. uh this uh, awkward uh, i mean uh, read the length distribution, which means that we have some uh, portions of damaged DNA and ancient DNA usually characterize that you get sometimes very short reads. And this peak in the last, it's uh, uh, how much base pairs is usually expected as an output from the sequ like sequence machine. Mm. And in case of the second case, uh, we usually get like the maximum possible uh, sequence uh, oh, sorry, read length because the sample is good and it is modern, and we have some other reads uh, which are not that good, but it is like random. And uh, in the damage pattern, uh, in the first case, it is like you explained, it starts from C to T and then turns to J to A. And in the second case, it seems to be that those, uh, this damage is like some random noise, I guess. Mm. Yes, exactly. This is completely correct. Uh, one thing which uh, people might have noticed is that the scaling of the uh, of the the y-axis on the on the bottom plot is very very small. It goes to from from zero to to zero point three percent. So there's almost uh, no damage here, whereas the range of the y-axis on the top one goes all the way up to twenty five percent. So it, it, this is completely correct. So for, for the second questions here, um, what uh, factors affects the rate of uh, decay of, uh, of DNA? I can answer if no one is against that. I mean, if no one else is, wants to answer. Yeah. Does someone else wants to answer? Well, I think you, you can you can continue then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the first question, I think the climate and if uh, the sample, I mean, on the body or I don't know whatever organism is uh, did contact, uh, you know, the soil a lot. So in the case if uh, we have let's say um, berry uh, which contacts so, like directly the soil, then we are going to have very high contamination. And probably we are not going to get something useful, even though the sample would be like relatively um, like ancient, but not that ancient. But still, we 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 are going to have so high contamination, so we can't really get anything useful from it. And uh, in other case, uh, we can have samples which are uh, stoned in ice or in some. Uh, you know, dry climate, 
and also isolated samples. Uh, in this case, the samples are going to be relatively good. So uh, the temperature, the humidity, and the direct contact to the air or to the soil uh, are the key factors, I think. Yes, uh, exactly everything that you said was correct. One thing that they are doing in the, um, in the clean lab is that they have UV lights. So uh, every night uh, between one and three, the UV lights are burning and this, uh, I think it's what is it called, blue light or black light also. And this is, um, it should be very good at uh, fragmenting the DNA even further. So, so, so this is also something that would uh, destroy the, the DNA. Good. So, okay, so I'll continue here if there was no uh, questions for, uh, for this. So of course the, the damage we we uh, it's of course not good to have damage because it's um, it, it 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 transforms your data so it it's not the original uh, molecule that you're looking at anymore right it's it's deaminated damage CS turned into a T and suddenly we have a twenty five percent too many T's at the at the first position in the read. But it is very, very important because it, uh, it, it's like the hallmark, it's the trademark of, uh, of ancient DNA. So if I went to, um, to, if I got a very good sample from uh, say Siberia and I, uh, I dug it out and I started analyzing and I got the data, then uh, we will need to see that it has a damage signal Otherwise, it could be modern day contaminants. It could be me that by accident sneezed in the sample and then suddenly I was not sequencing the, uh, the sample I was interested in, but I was sequencing myself. So what, what we uh, tend to do when we are working with ancient DNA is that we do a small screening run to begin with. Then we authenticate that it has a damaged signal and then afterwards, we, uh, we, we, we do a deep sequencing and then we continue working with it because if it is contaminated or if it doesn't contain any DNA at all, we don't want to continue use it. There's been some recent developments in the wet lab protocols. It's actually possible now to uh, enzymatically remove this damage signal. So if you had um, a seed that turned into a uracil, then instead of converting this into a thymine at T, then you can convert it back into a C. So what we are doing for the deep sequencing analysis is that we are, we are removing the damage enzymatically after we have verified, authenticated that it was uh, ancient. Before we uh, could do these things with removing the, the damage, then in, in the downstream analysis, this excess uh, C to T was uh, quite a concern. And, and people dealt with this in, a, in different ways. Either you could, when you were looking at your, your read, you could simply discard the first uh, five base pairs and the, the last five base pairs, and then do the analysis based on the, the remaining. This is, um, is of course a valid approach. Some of the reads might be uh, become so small that you cannot map them anymore. Another approach to do is to uh, is to look at all these uh, possible C to T sites. These are actually a subset of uh, variants which are called transitions. The remaining ones are called transversions. So what we could do was simply to remove all those uh, transitions from the data set. So there we would also lose data. But this was what people did for, uh, for, for quite some time, especially when they were using uh, SNP chip uh, data sets. This is... Um, this is fine for, uh, for most demographic uh, analysis, because if, if you have a population that's expanding or, or shrinking, then that would affect the transition and transversion uh, to equal amount. Of course, it's a problem if you're trying to look at specific positions uh, to see if there's been selecting going on or, or these very local, uh, localized information. Yeah, okay, so... Um, yeah, so here I'm saying that we increase coverage. What this means here is that we are, um, we are uh, after we have removed the damage, then we start to boost the sequencing. So the damage will get out of, out of this in the end, it shouldn't contain any uh, damage. Then we can apply uh, most of the standard uh, downstream tools for, for analyzing it. 
Okay, so this is uh, when you are. The, this is regarding the the wet lab work, which is also important here to understand the the caveats with the ancient data. Uh, basically, you you pick a sample, you do your wet lab work, you you sequence it, and then you analyze it. In in, in greater details, we have our we have our sample that where we uh, we are interested in. It could look like this. Then you start out by cleaning it, so you remove the outer layer. Right. So so this you drill off with a Dremel. Uh, I think it's called a Dremel uh, machine. So you just clean out the outside, in this case, a tooth. So you are, have removed all outside contaminants that, have, uh, that are sitting on it. Then you crush it. Then you get this uh, powder. Then you use something which is called a digestion a buffer, a kind of enzyme that will destroy what is not the DNA. Then you put in a binding buffer, which will bind the DNA. And then you have this... Uh, illusion is this kind of tube and then the dna will be a very small uh, pellet in, in in the bottom of of this tube which looks like um, a, a small pearl this is your this is your raw extract this is your, your your dna molecules that you have that you were able to obtain from this process this we cannot uh, sequence directly we need to uh, I think Ross also talked a bit about this. You need to, to put something on, on these uh, fragments in order for the uh, sequencing machine to actually sequence it. This is uh, putting adapters and index sequences on it. But this is uh, very basically uh, how, how things are, are done in the, uh, in the lab. We can sequence many different types. Historically, we have been focused on uh, bones, which was uh, the most well-preserved. People have also been using it teeth, uh, tooth, which um, they've also used something which is called the calculus. And this is not the, the math discipline. This is the, the stuff you get on your teeth. If you don't brush them enough, you can sequence that also. You can also sequence hair and fur, and you can essentially sequence everything that has, uh, that has cells in it. Also shells and then pollen poses a, a, a larger problem because the the, 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 the pollen shell is very, very hard, so that needs to be uh, crushed. You can also uh, sequence uh, fossil feces, like uh, ancient uh, shit. This is, um, there's of course some questions here. Are we sequencing the host organism or, or are we sequencing the, 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 the gut biome instead? So this would be, uh, this kind of opened up for this. Uh, you can also use DNA sequencing for, uh, for environmental studies, for sediments. If, you, um, if you're digging down into the ground, then as further as you go down, the, it will get older and older. So if you're sequencing something on the top and you're looking at, at, the, uh, at the variability, then you can see what, what kind of animal lived at that time. We do the same for ice cores. This is an ice core from, uh, from Greenland. People have also been studying uh, like old pre-domesticated uh, crops like, like maize. So this is that we can sequence uh, almost uh, everything. Some people are also looking into sequencing the, the air actually I've heard. So what you have is that um, if you put up a piece of cloth outside, then uh, then the air will, will flow through it, and then some DNA will stick to this cloth, and then you can, um, then you can sequence that and then see what, what was in the air. Okay. Okay, so here is a full table of uh, the characteristics for, for the different samples. I'm not going through uh, all of these. The most important the tooth and bone, which are what we've used the most. If we are using a tooth, then we can get the most of the DNA and most of the host DNA. Here the host DNA means the sample that we are actually interested in sequencing, but we'll also get the non-host DNA that could be um, like from, uh, from uh, the microbial and infectious diseases and other DNA that uh, was associated with this tooth. It's relatively easy to, um, 
to sequence uh, tooth. Now there are protocols for this. And then you can see here on the right side what, um, what it's being used for. Of course, if it's human, we're using it for pop gen and selection and domesticate demography and, and diseases. This is a, uh, different from uh, the sediments where we are using it for looking at how the climate has changed the environment and uh, the ecology. Okay, so, so this is the characteristics of the different uh, types of samples that we could sequence. One, I mentioned that the damage signal was one of the hallmarks of ancient DNA and another um, aspect of ancient DNA, which is uh, in, ends up explaining why it's so, so ex extremely expensive is that we have very, very little uh, material. If I wanted to sequence my, uh, myself, then I could take some of my blood, I would uh, sequence it, and then I would, um, and then most of my DNA would be, uh, mo most of the DNA that was sequenced would be my DNA, because there were so many uh, mo uh, biological molecules for me in, 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 in my blood. If you're doing an ancient, uh, if you're sequencing an ancient sample, then a very small proportion of, of the reads that you're getting out of it will map to, uh, to the human genome. There's this huge blob of, uh, of black matter, which is stuff we, we don't know uh, what is. Most likely it's, uh, it's bacteria that has been uh, completely uh, deaminated, so we, we can't get anything useful out of it. We, of course, also get bacterial and unknown stuff in a modern sample, but to a much smaller degree. And if you look at all those uh, reads that we do not know where come from, then we can actually start mining those. There was recently a study where they were looking at the plague in our, um, in our sequencing center, so they could actually see, uh, find the plague uh, in, in the samples which is uh, very useful, right? Then you can, then you can look at, uh, at pandemics from, from the past. And the proportion of uh, the endogenous, the proportion of uh, human stuff in our sample is, is very, very different between samples. Even though they weren't, uh, it was from a graveyard just next to each other, it might be different how, how well preserved they are. Okay, so this, um, this is a skull. So you can see that this is the, the jawbone here. These red line indicates that there's uh, an eye, I think. And I'm not sure what, uh, what this part is. I, I'm not uh, good with anatomy. anatomy, anatomy. So, so, uh, so what, what we are trying to say here is that um, which part of a bone that we are using or which part of the sample that we are, it, it's, it's, it's very important. You don't get the same results from a, from a, from a, a leg from, compared to what you do from a tooth. And what they have uh, found out is that uh, one of the best uh, places to, to sample from when you are extracting your DNA is something which is called the, the petrous bone. This is uh, inside your head, just behind your ear in the center. And it's, it's, I think it's the hardest uh, bone in the, in the human body. So from a study in 2014, they, they looked at, uh, at the different sample, at, at one sample, but the different uh, bones. So this was from the, the leg bone, the, the tibia, I think it's called. And then they were sequencing the, the petrous bone. And here they got a much higher proportion of human DNA. And this was uh, something they saw across all the samples they were analyzing. So there was much more DNA material in the, um, in the petrous bone compared to anything else in this study. So this would indicate, okay, yes. Another thing to, uh, to consider is that it, uh, this, before you start doing your, your sequencing, it's actually worthwhile just to, uh, to look at the sample. How, how well preserved uh, does it look? These uh, teeth on the left, they, they look horribly uh, degraded. And if, you are, if you're doing the sequencing, you'll find nothing. 
if you compare those to the ones on the right, they look much better preserved. So just by visually inspecting the sample, you can actually uh, see uh, which, which sample is worthwhile uh, analyzing. And then there are other examples for this. So based on this slide, it would mean that we should always just use the Petrus bone. But th there are some uh, drawbacks with using the, the, the Petrus bone co compared to, the, to using a te uh, the tooth. Yes. Um, if you are using a tooth from a, an adult, then the, you can use the isotope within that tooth to see, to see what the, the person, where the person has been living. You can do these fancy isotopic analysis, which you cannot do with the, with the Petrus bone. So, and if you are, if the tooth that you are using is very well preserved, then you get uh, roughly the same amount of uh, endogenous uh, material, or at least you can get almost the same amount of data out of it if it's a well preserved. Of course, if it's a very poorly preserved tooth, then uh, you get much, much less than you did with, uh, with, with the Petrus bone. Okay, so this is the final slide about, uh, about the wet lab. And uh, the, the conclusion here is that uh, we can, um, these pre-digestion uh, enzymes and, and binding buffers that we're using is it, very, very much determining the, the quality and the number of reads we get out of it. These are uh, three different methods outlined as, as rows in, in this plot. Here we see the read length distribution of, uh, of these uh, samples. What we notice here is that we have in, in all different approaches, we have a, a large peak around the 10,000 base pairs. And this would be a modern day contaminant, which are, are not ancient. So this is something we would not really be interested, but it's something we, we always observe because when you're sequencing something that ancient, there will, there will of course be something modern that you're sequencing at the same time. So what you are interested in is to have a large peak around the 35 to, uh, to 100 because this would be the authentic uh, ancient DNA. So just by the choice of a pre-digesting enzyme and binding buffers, you can improve the, the data that you're getting a, a lot. Okay, so, um, so if you are to, uh, to, to, uh, to do these ancient studies, then there's, uh, there can be potential problems, right? It gets easily contaminated with modern human uh, DNA. So if this is some pictures from, from a dig and they're cleaning it and uh, then it's being put into a, a museum where, where people can touch it. So, so would these be good samples to uh, analyze? This would be, would be horrible. What you need to do is to, uh, is to look like this instead. Right? You need to, if you, are, if you are doing this, then you need to have uh, gloves on. You need to uh, take your sample directly and put it in a Ziploc bag. You need to have this uh, face mask which was a lot more exotic before the corona. You, uh, you shouldn't start, try to clean it in the, in the field. You should do this back in the, in the lab and you should, if possible, put it directly into a, a very cold environment and then apply these uh, wet lab procedures. So the, the, the problem here is that we can, uh, contamination might arise. We, we are not interested in sequencing the the person that, uh, that collected the samples. We're interested in, in what they have found. So we try to track contamination in, in multiple different ways. I started out talking about this uh, mitochondrial genome. So this is something that exists for, that you only get from your mother. So there should be no variability on the MT for, uh, for, for, for an individual. So if you are looking at the, if you observe the variation of your mitochondrial genome, then that would indicate that there's been some kind of contamination going on. If the sample you're looking at is, is a male, you have, um, you have these 22 uh, chromosomes, which are exact copies from your father and mother. Then you have your, uh, your sex chromosome and uh, 
If you're female, then you have two X chromosomes. These might be different because you get one from your father and one from your mother. But if you are looking at a male, then you have one Y chromosome and one X chromosome. So any difference you observe on the Y and X chromosome in a male would indicate contamination or, or damage, of course. So these are the uh, methods that we are, we, are, we are using. We recently developed a, a method for for estimating the contamina contamination level for, for haploid chromosomes. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so for people that go into the lab, it, it, the procedure is to go from left to right. They have their, um, their tooth, they, they crush it, they get this, they use uh, digestion and binding buffers, you have your illusion, the DNA pellet in the bottom, of this small tube, you put enzymes and adapters on this. Then now you have your sequencing library. Then you amplify your library. This means just making copies and copies and copies. So you'll get millions of copies here. And what the rule is that you can go from left to right in the same day, but you can never go from, uh, from uh, right to left. Because as soon as you've been in contact or in the same room, or even maybe the same building as a PCR machine, then you'll have uh, DNA everywhere on you, on your hands, in your hair, in, on, on your clothes. So the rules here in the, the lab in, uh, in Copenhagen is that uh, if you want need to go back to the, to the clean lab, then you need to uh, go back home, take a shower, change clothes, and, and then come back. Or ideally, you should uh, go, wait a few days. So. Uh, in uh, Copenhagen, the clean lab, this is where they do the extraction and build the libraries of the ancient genomes. And this is over here where they do the sequencing and where, where they uh, are amplifying it. So these are completely different. I think there's 500 meters uh, between in order to avoid this kind of uh, contamination. Because this is where the largest risk of uh, contamination is. That is from the amplified libraries. There is, of course, a risk that uh, when you're handling the, the sample that you're contaminating it, but that is much yeah. smaller. And you might even have two, uh, two different sample lying on, uh, on your desk. And uh, if there's not a very large risk of they contaminating each other because there's so little DNA in, um, in it to begin with. So there's not a very, so there's a much larger chance that you, you are by accident doing sample swaps that you're mixing them up, but that's not really a contamination uh, issue. Okay, and this is uh, this is how it, it looks. This uh, clean lab facility, it's uh, restricted access, and people need to uh, to have a course on how to uh, to behave in in this uh, setting. The rooms are under pressure. So it's, uh, you have excess pressure in these rooms, so no outside air can come in, only inside air can come out. You need to uh, switch suit. You have, uh, you have these suits that you take on and you need to have uh, socks you put on top of your regular socks and you need to put these shoes on. So, so it's very, very clean. And when you uh, enter the, the lab, this is uh, what it looks and it's a, uh, it's a very hostile environment. It's, it's not, not nice to work in. It's, um, I've been there only two or three times. I, I, I don't work like this. I work on the computer. And it's, um, I, it, it's not something I, I, I like to do, but it's uh, did something that's important to know how, how it's being done. So the content of what they have in, these, uh, in this clean lab is actually a standard equipment. The only difference is that it's so extremely clean that we do not expect any DNA to actually be in that room apart from the samples. So every night it's uh, being cleaned up with, with bleach. When you enter the, um, the clean lab, you have gloves on, you need to dip them in, uh, in bleach to destroy all the DNA. Every night it's being cleaned up, well, maybe uh, three times a week. I'm not sure how often this has been done. They clean everything with bleach and the uh, ultraviolet black light is also running. But all the, the equipment they have is standard equipment. It's just the, the room itself that are so incredibly clean. Okay, so uh, the, the final aspect, which is uh, important to, uh, to talk about, 
is, uh, is this concept of uh, clonality and, and complexity. So you had your, your DNA pellet in the tube, right? This is uh, what we would call a molecular biology library. This is where you have, uh, have your DNA. So when you are making a sequence library, then you are taking a subset of this molecular library, and then you build a sequencing library that you could put onto uh, the, the sequencing machine. And the way this is done, well, it's of course a subset. It might be a very large su uh, subset, but it is a subset. Because even if you took, took everything, then by the process where you put adapters on these fragments, you are likely not to, uh, to get everything. So our original molecule here is what is called unknown. Then we put these adapter sequences on, on both ends. This might contain, contain index sequences and, and index sequences is a trick you are using if you want to, um, if you are, want to uh, sequence multiple individuals or libraries in, in, in the same run on the machine, then you can, uh, then you can determine by which adapters and which index sequence you put on where the sample came from. So our original fragment, the one we are interested in analyzing is the red part. And when we are doing the sequencing, then we are reading all this here, but we throw this away, we remove the adapters and then we, we retain the red part. And if the, the, the length of our DNA fragment is shorter, than, the, than what we're actually sequencing, then we'll start to sequence into the adapter on the other end. So those will need to be discarded. I think Ross talked about this uh, in some of the prior sessions. Okay, there's uh, different um, production strategies here. I'm not going to talk about PCI. I think this is uh, completely deprecated. Nobody's doing this anymore. So there's a whole genome sequencing, there's targeted sequencing, and there's a SNP chip. Whole genome sequencing is where we blindly sequence everything. Targeted sequencing is where we are, have an idea on specific regions for a specific species or reference genome that we are interested in. So when we are building the library, it's a complicated process, then we can, um, then we can focus on those regions Finally, there's this thing called the SNP chip. This is what you would get from a commercial company like Family Tree and Ancestry and uh, 23andMe. There you give them your, 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 your DNA and then they'll give you uh, your, your data back in the form of, uh, of genotypes from a, a SNP array. So if you have a, a modern sample, then all the, uh, the blue lines here, those indicate um, uh, different uh, fragments, different molecules. If it's an ancient sample, then when you're doing the, um, the, the PCR, when, when you're amplifying your library, because there were there, there's not that many variability in, in that you don't have that much uh, biological material to begin with. So when you're amplifying it, you end up amplifying the same uh, fragments many times. So all the, the, the ones with the same color represent the, the same exact uh, fragment, okay? So there's a lot of redundancy in an ancient sample compared to a modern sample. So if you have, uh, the, if you have many, many different molecules in your library, you would say that it has high complexity. If you have very, very few distinct biological molecules, you will have lower complexity, okay? So when you're doing the sequencing, when you're doing the sequencing, then you'll end up sequencing the same read again and again and again. On this figure here on, on the x-axis, this is the number of uh, reads we are sequencing from the sequencing machine. <laughs> And then on the y-axis, there we are counting how many new sequences we observe. Okay, so what, what we are seeing here is that, that they're going to plateau after we reached a specific saturation level, then we do not get, get any new uh, fragments or any new reads out from the sequencing machine. If it's a very, very good sample, this could be uh, like this um, from, from an elephant. 
the tusk from, from an elephant in this example, then it's a very good one, which means that you have many distinct molecules. So you, you'll, read, you'll be able to obtain many, many more reads. If it's a very, very poor sample, then you'll have saturated your library after just a few uh, sequencing reads. So this is, um, so, to, so based on the screening run we are doing when we are authenticating the DNA, then we can try to extrapolate how much data can, can we get out of these uh, libraries. And these are one of the research projects we are currently looking into. And this is, um, this is based on using the duplication rate as a, as a kind of proxy for, the, for how many free uh, molecules we have in, in our libraries. Whenever we have a read which is the same as something we have sequenced before, we call, we call this a duplicate. So uh, an analogy could be that you are in, in the rainforest and you want to figure out how many, uh, well, what's the population size of uh, elephants in this rainforest. Then one year you can go out there, you can um, capture 100 elephants, paint um, a blue uh, mark on them, and then release them into the wild. Then you come back next year and then you, uh, you capture 100 elephants ag again. If all 100 elephants had the same blue mark, then you would uh, expect that the free population living was, 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 would be almost non-existing because you recaptured everything. If you only capture a few with this uh, blue mark, then you would assume that there was a very large uh, free population of um, of these elephants. This is the same approach we are doing to estimate how much data we can get out of it. Then we are, we are not talking about elephants, we're talking about uh, the number of reads and uh, the blue mark we put on them. Those are the duplicates. Okay, so um, um, here in, we need some metrics to quantify how much data we are getting out of, um, out of these, uh, out of these uh, libraries. So I think Ross talked a bit about um, coverage and depth of coverage. Does anybody re remember what the definition of the, um, of what depth is? I sure they do, but a bit too shy. Ah, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Is there somebody that's not shy that uh, wants to uh, to say it? Okay, so so I'll I'll, I'll talk to this. I understand that uh, people shouldn't be scared of uh, I'm suddenly asking these uh, random questions and pulling out people. So so I'll just explain it. <laughs> so here we have your your reads. These are the rows. Okay. So here we have the position on a reference genome. So this could be position one, position two, position three, position 100. So this indicates a read, this indicates a read, this indicates a read, okay? So the depth for a position would be the, the number of rows we have. That is the number of overlapping reads for, for a specific position. We call this the depth, okay? So you can calculate the depth for all positions and then you can take the mean value. This is the, the depth of coverage. And this is something that's a very useful metric for figuring out how much data we have, because it's the depth of data that really determines uh, how well we can do the, our downstream analysis. Okay, so in this example, this is from a screening run. We are sequencing uh, 20 million reads and um, what I want to uh, explain with this one is that the endogenous content, the proportion of uh, human data or the uh, host organism that you're interested in, in sequencing is very, very much determining how much data you can get out of it. If you are sequencing a modern uh, human, then you have 100% endogenous. You have... Um, and since uh, you, everything is uh, endogenous, you are mapping 20 million reads to the human genome. The reads are very long, they're 125 uh, base pairs. And just from this uh, screening run, then you get a depth of coverage of around uh, 0.8x, okay? And uh, you have, that, that you have uh, a depth of coverage above one 
for uh, three quarters of, uh, of your genome. Okay, this is if you have an endogenous content of 100, but we never have this with, with ancient data. It's much smaller. If it's 15%, then it's a, it's a good sample. So then you take 15% out of the, the, the 20 million, your reads are much smaller. So now you are only covering uh, less than 5% with a depth of coverage around uh, above one. And your overall depth of coverage is now 0.05x. And if you wanted to sequence and you kept on sequencing, then the maximum possible depth of coverage you could obtain would be around 10 to 20 X, but this would also be very expensive. But this would be a good ancient sample. If it's a very poorly preserved ancient sample, then it's 1%. And then suddenly 1% of 20 million is only 200,000 reads. And then you can see how low these, uh, the depth of coverage is now 0.003 X and it will not be possible to obtain a depth of coverage uh, above 1x. And this is, here we are talking, we are using the endogenous content as a kind of, uh, of proxy because it correlates to the clonality of your, of your library, right? That's, um, that's what we are doing here. So the endogenous content is what we are using uh, most of the time to, to actually figure out how, how, how good a, a sample it is. Okay, so uh, targeted sequencing, I'm not going to uh, talk so much about this. It can be very useful for, for some samples that I, if you know exactly what you're looking for. If I was interested in uh, figuring out uh, lactase persistence in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia in, uh, in ancient time, I. I could collect a lot of samples from, from these areas, and then I could uh, just sequence this exact region of, your, of the reference. And that would be around a two megabase uh, region compared to a three gigabase region. So if you know exactly what you're looking for, then target sequencing can be uh, very useful. SNP arrays, um, this is not being used uh, that much, I think, for, for ancient mainly due to that it's uh, very difficult because you, you have reads that are very small. Technically, you need to have your, your plate and then you need to have probe that binds specifically. So you need to have longer reads and for ancient data, you have uh, short reads. But what is a very important aspect with the uh, SNP chip data is that you are getting the, uh, the genotype, right? So, so the genotype is this, uh, is the combination of allele for an individual, which we have huge, huge problems with uh, for, for ancient data and for low coverage data. We do not know what the genotype is, but if you're using SNP chip, then you get your genotype readily available. In, uh, and you, it even includes a kind of probability measure, but it's with very, very high, it's high quality genotype cores you get with a SNP chip array. Okay, so uh, here's a table that outlines the the, the pros and cons with these different uh, production strategies. I think uh, we covered uh, most of this. Um, yes, whole genome sequencing is the uh, is best for, for for the ancient because it's um, because you get everything. You get a complete slice of uh, of, of everything that you uh, that you want. You can use it for pathogens. If you're doing targeted sequence, you're only getting a subset. There's also this thing that uh, if you have limited extract, you don't, might not have so much material, then uh, then should should we then waste it on uh, on finding the lactase uh, region only, or should we actually try to uh, to sequence everything now that we have the extract? And here's a, a full uh, table that uh, puts a lot more details on this. I'm not going through with this. If you're interested in this, then you can uh, can see what, what the pros and cons are for these uh, different uh, approaches. At the uh, Geogenics, where, where I'm located, we are mainly doing a whole genome uh, shotgun sequencing, which is where, where you get everything. Okay, and finally, we are... Um, since it's a destructive process to, uh, to, to sequence uh, uh, ancient DNA, right? It's, if, I, if we want to sequence me, we could just take some of, of, my, of my blood, right? I'm generating new blood all the time, so we, we are not losing anything, but it is a destructive process to, uh, 
to, to do this for ancient stuff. So whenever we are, we are, we are uh, have a sample that we are interested in, we start by making a digital copy. And then if needed, we can uh, do like a 3D uh, printer to get a, a replica of it. Or well, this is something we are doing. Okay, so, so in summary here, in summary, the uh, authentic uh, DNA is short and damaged, sears turn into a T. Sample uh, type is very important, petrous bone or tooth. The quality matter, it's, uh, you need to visually inspect um, how, uh, how good it is before you are wasting time on it. It's the library complexity that determines how much data you can get out of it. There's a risk of uh, contamination, mostly from the amplified uh, libraries, but mostly from uh, modern day uh, G DNA in general. And if you are working with this, then you are, um, then you need to have these uh, clean lab facilities, which is uh, quite, you also need to have, uh, for each room, you need to have a specialized air circulation. So it's not the same air that floats around. Okay, so these slides are based on slides from uh, Lasse Vinder. He's the head of the sequencing center. He's uh, pictured here. So uh, feel free to use the slides. I, I put them on the, uh, on the chat window where you should be able to download them. But I don't think I have his permission for actually distribute them publicly, but, but feel free to use them for, for, for this uh, course. Okay, so this uh, is, um, this is the final slide before we move to the more mathematical part, right? So this was just an introduction to ancient DNA because I think most people are very interested in ancient DNA. So while I, uh, I prepare the next slideshow, then uh, please think a bit about uh, the ethics, which is becoming uh, more and more important with, uh, with ancient DNA. So, uh, so do this uh, breakout room for uh, five minutes. I think you can talk about this very fast. And then we'll uh, talk a bit about this ethics, and then I'll continue with the with the final part, the, the next slideshow that I'll also put on the um, on the uh, on the chat window, so you can also see that. Okay, uh, I, I assume everybody is uh, back now. So that so so these are ethics questions, and and when I started with the. Uh, being involved with, with ancient DNA, it was much less of a, something that, that was discussed that, than it is now. So it's, it's something, and there's of course no correct answer, right? But it, it's, it's something to, to consider. So uh, sh is it okay to, to destroy samples to, to enable to do this uh, DNA analysis? This is a very common uh, issue if you go to a museum and then you are asking, uh, can, can we sequence the DNA? Well, that's fine. How do you want to do it? Well, we are, we are going to use the petrous bones. We are going to crush the skull, right? This is, um, the, then you're losing a valuable uh, information. The museum is, is likely to, to decline. So it's, um, th th that's, that's one thing. And also, I think there's also kind of this moral obligation that as, when we have destroyed the sample, or tooth, then we should also get as much as, as possible out of it. Because if, I, uh, if I'm running an analysis on my computer and something goes wrong, then I can just redo it, right? I can do this over and over. It's not a destructive uh, process. Whenever you're doing uh, extractions from a, from a sample, this is a destructive uh, process. And every time you're making new libraries from these uh, molecular libraries, then you're losing uh, biological uh, material. So you cannot continue to do these things. If we go to the, um, if we, um, if we go to some places in the world and then we find uh, some bones that are 10,000 years old, who should we ask for permission to use this? The population that lived in this area is very likely to, to not exist more. It's, it's very likely to be a, a population that was replaced by, uh, by the people that, that lives there. Or there have been multiple um, populations, uh, changes, replacements over time. So who, who, who owns the, 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 
the materials. It, it's it's not it, it's not the easy answers. We've had a lot of good co collaborations with uh, with the Native Americans from from the Americas, and that they have very very strong um, uh, consent forms, and they they very much believe in. Uh, in the material, in the person that is, is almost still living in the material. And this is, of course, something that, that should be respected. Other populations are, might not be so sensitive. It might also have to do with the, the history of how Native Americans have, uh, have been treated in the US, so they might be more skeptical. So, so there, there are many uh, aspects of, of this. Okay, is there anything that uh, people have questions about this ancient DNA part? Otherwise, I'll continue swiftly to the uh, to the main part. Seems no. Okay, good, super. Okay, so I'll um, so I've put the next slide on the. Um, on the uh, on the chat window, so everybody can uh, can find this if uh, if they want to follow it themselves. Let's just share. Okay. Okay. Super. Okay. So here we we will most definitely not uh, go through everything here. It's a uh, it took a bit longer this uh, lab part than what I had uh, thought, but hopefully people found it uh, interesting. So I'll go, th the introduction is uh, something that, um, that Ross talked about. And then, so I'll, I'll go briefly through this. I'll talk a bit about the genotype likelihoods, and then I'll end up with how to call genotypes. And, and then we will not go through the uh, MAF estimation and association, but I think we'll start the, the next session in a week with, uh, with this. Okay, so um, today we'll not uh, talk about how to generate these fancy plots that tells you about the ancestry of different individuals and populations, and we'll not talk about the site frequency spectrum that Erasmus talked about. This is just some nice visualizations of what, what we'll do at some point over the next sessions. So for, for today, I'll, uh, I'll um, go back to these uh, definitions that uh, Rasmus talked about, an allele, what is an allele, a genotype, uh, frequency, homozygous, heterozygous, Rasmus talked about this. And I'll uh, talk briefly about uh, the different file formats. I'll not explain them, I'll just, uh, I'll just mention them again. So if people have forgotten, they'll, uh, they'll remember it again. I'll go through uh, what a genotype likelihood is and how these are being calculated. And then I'll, um, I'll uh, try to explain why it is very difficult to, uh, to call genotypes. Right now, you do not know what genotype calling is, but we, we will get to that. And that this is one of the, the problem with ancient data and uh, low coverage data that we do not have this ability of calling a genotype reliably. Okay, so um, this is an outline. Let's skip this. I talked a lot about the low level stuff. The standard workflow is that you do all this low level stuff in the lab. You have a, your BAM file. Then you, uh, you want to obtain uh, genotypes. We call this called genotypes. And this is done by first calculating genotype likelihoods. And then you're calculating some sort of uh, population information, which can be a yield or haplotype frequencies. And, you can calculate genotype probabilities. And then based on the called genotypes, then you can do your, your downstream analysis. And this is where we will be the, for the next sessions. But I'll go through this part about genotype likelihoods and, and how to call genotypes because it's so fundamental for, uh, for, for what we're doing. Okay, so you have unmapped reads. This is in the container format called the fast queues. These are faster files with qualities. You map those. Now you have BAM files. These are binary SAM files. These contains the, the map reads. Then you can start to call a variant position. This is normally put in the container format called VCF or, or, or BCF. Okay. Fast queue. If, um, if there's questions about this, we, we can talk about it. But I think uh, Ross went through all this. Each, 
each read covers four lines. You have the name, uh, you have your sequence and you have your quality. You, um, when you have mapped it, then you have your original read and your quality score that was from your fast Q file. Since you have mapped it, now you have uh, information about uh, the position where it maps to. The aligner might also give you information about uh, how, how good it, if it maps to multiple places. And the mismatch here is the edit distance. That is the, the difference to the reference for, the, for this read itself. It will also tell you which strand you've been sequencing. You have your backbone, which one were you sequencing? It will also give you the mapping quality. This is contained in the SAM BAM or, or even CRAM format. And this is, um, this might not be so. So I think uh, again, as Ross talked about this, this is not uh, super relevant for, for the downstream analysis. It's just important to know that all information about your, your, your read exists in this uh, SAM and, and BAM file. One thing which is important here is that actually this, the tenth column of a SAM file, which is called the inferred insert size. This is actually the fragment length that we are, uh, that we have from when we built the libraries. Okay, so um, so quality scores. You have your your read that is being uh, sequenced for each base in your read. You are getting a probability of, of error from the uh, base caller. The output from the sequencing machine is like a small video or photograph. This is being converted into, it's being discretized into a called base A, C, G, or T. How well it could discretize this is, is uh, given in this information, which is called the quality score, okay? So your read is a vector of A, C, from the alphabet A, C, G, and T. The quality score is a vector of the same length that has these ASCII characters. And the, so these ASCII characters are, um, I, uh, it, it becomes a bit technical, but it's, um, uh, so you have your ASCII characters. If you look up at an ASCII table, if you're a computer scientist, you, you know this by heart. If you have your, your ASCII table, then you can see what is the ASCII value of a specific character. This corresponds to a, to a value. And then in this uh, in this um, in this scaling, which is called the Fred scaling, everything is shifted by a thirty three base pair or th a value of thirty three. And the reason for this is uh, is that the first uh, thirty three uh, ASCII characters are not really characters that are visible. These could be spaces or tabs, and it it's also these more. Uh, things that if you press tap too many times in a Unix window, the screen will go blinking, right? That's called bell. That's also an ASCII character. So the visible characters that we can see in an ASCII table, it starts at 33. So if you have a, a, a ASCII of five, no, a, a, the, the value five here, okay? If you're looking up an ASCII table, that corresponds to a quality score of 20. This means that the ASCII value five, convert that into a, look at the ASCII table, that is a Q score of 20. Okay, so the quality score is the error rate in log 10, and then you uh, multiply by minus 10. This is if you have what the probability is, but, but we normally have, we go the other way around. We have what the, Q, the quality score from the sequencing machine, and then we just flip things around so we take our quality score, plug into this equation, and then we'll get a probability here, which we call the epsilon. Okay, so a quality score of 20 corresponds to a probability of 1%. This is the probability that the, that the base is incorrectly called. Okay, so the probability that it is correctly called is uh, one minus this uh, probability. Okay, so, here we talked about the, uh, the, the map reads and, and the depth. This is, uh, you should know this by heart. We have the, uh, the reads laid out as rows. If you're interested in the data for a specific position, then this would be an example where we have this, have put this frame on it. 
And we have colored this here. So all those with a quality score of less than 20, we are, have been colored uh, green. So it's only a subset of the data that has a, a probability of uh, error being uh, less than uh, 1%. Okay, so, okay, sorry. Here, okay, we can look at the depth distribution. The depth distribution should follow a Poisson distribution. We, we are likely not to have this, but this is what it should be in a theory. There are large uh, regions of the genome that we cannot map to. Um, this is, uh, would be uh, the region surrounding the, uh, the center. So a normal chromosome can look like a small X, right? You have your, your, your chromosome arms. So the center, where it's located is called the centromeres. The termini of, the, uh, of these chromosomes are called the, the telomeres. This is very difficult to map to. These are not uh, well-defined. There might also be very large regions that are repeats. We cannot uh, map to those either. So we do not expect to get, um, to uh, actually hit every point of a reference genome when we do the mapping. So, uh, and Okay, so it, what we were supposed to have a small um, uh, breakout room session now, but given the time, I think I'll just go through this uh, exercise here and explain it uh, directly. Rasmus talked about what, what alleles were. And he also talked about what genotypes are and what allele frequencies, uh, what they were. Here is an example where we have uh, one, two, three individuals, right? So this would be the chromosomes for, for the chromosome for the first individual, that would be the two first rows for the second individuals and for the third individuals, okay? So, so an allele that is defined as the variant form of a gene, okay? So, and, and the genotype, that is the allele for a specific individual. So if we go back to, uh, to this example, then GG would be the genotypes associated with this position for the first individual. If you look at the, one, two, at the fourth position for this individual, then that uh, individual would have the, uh, the genotype AG. The A could be from the mother, the G could be from the father. So in this context, an allele is simply a, a nucleotide, a, a base, okay? And this is again, uh, we, we are looking at diploids. If we had, had looking at, uh, at plants that, that might have four sets of chromosomes, then the, then the genotype would have been four bases, okay? The allele frequency, that is just the frequency of the, of the individual allele, of the single allele. For this position, if we are looking at the allele frequency of A, we are observing three A's out of six, so that would be a half. If we are looking at uh, this one over here, might be more interesting. Here we have the allele frequency of T, that is two out of six, so that would be one third. The allele frequency for, uh, for A would be one minus, okay? So here's this thing that uh, sometimes when we talk about frequencies, we are talking about the relative or the absolute frequencies. And it's a bit dependent on the, uh, on the context, what we are using. The absolute frequencies would be the counts that would be like the natural number. The relative frequency is where we just normalize things to, to be a probability of between zero and one. Okay, so sequencing data, what, what is the, uh, the fundamental problem here? if you're working with, uh, especially with low coverage data. The problem is that we do not know what the genotype is for a specific uh, position. We do not get the, the, the genotypes. These are some uh, unobserved things that's happening on the sequencing machine. And it's a product of, uh, of library that is being built and uh, binding buffer. So, so we, we do not get the, the genotypes. What we do get is, uh, are these reads that are being sequenced and they're sequenced with, with, uh, with replacement. So, so if we look at a specific position, then we'll, we don't get the, the genotype, we'll just get a, a set of, uh, of alleles or, or bases that, uh, that comes from, from different reads that uh, overlaps this position. 
but we, we are not interested in this nice big full distribution of different uh, sequenced alleles. We are interested in, in the underlying unobserved genotype that has generated this uh, data that we, uh, that we observe. And this is what is called the genotype calling. That is the process of going from the sequencing data to figuring out what the call genotype is. And this is of course a hard call Right? So calling genotypes is a hard call. Then you say it's an AA or AC. You can, of course, try to, uh, to calculate a posterior probability of, um, of these genotypes calls, but, but then it's not really a call genotype anymore. Okay? And this is drastically different from the SNP chip data where you get the genotype directly from the technology from the platform itself. Okay? So the important thing here is we do not know what the genotype is. Okay, this is the, the most important thing here is we do not know what the genotype is. This is what we are trying to, to figure out. Okay, Let, let's look at an example here. For one position, we are, we are assuming all these sequencing machine comes with an error rate. This is highly variable along the position in the read and the, where you are mapping to. It's a, it's a complex measure because it also has to do with the mapping quality. So for this specific position, we are assuming an error rate of 1%. We observe two Cs and nine Cs. Then the open question is, what is the, uh, the true genotype for this, for, for this position? Is the individual uh, heterozygous for, for the CT? Here heterozygous, that means that it's, uh, the two alleles are different. If the two alleles are the same, we call it homozygous. Okay, heterozygous, homozygous. Heterozygous means that, that, that they're different. Okay, so if we wanted to, to model this, then maybe we can model this as a kind of a binomial. If we're assuming it's heterozygous, then the underlying genotype are both alleles. So we have the probability that we observe a zero and, and one or two or three of the T's. This is associated with this probability. The question is, of course, the probability that if you observe two or less minor bases, the, the minor just means that the less frequently observed one. So that would be the sum of these uh, distribution over here. And that ends up being a 6.5%. This is assuming that the, it was a heterocycle that was generating this uh, sequencing data. On the other hand, if we are assuming it's, um, it's homozygous, then we have, uh, have the same genotype. We have the same alleles as, as the genotype, either A, C, C, or T, T, but we have a probability of error of 1%. If you have a probability of error, then, the, then we have a very high probability of not observing any errors. The probability of error if we observe one is somewhat higher. So if the probability that we have two or more errors would be the sum of these, that ends up being very, very small. It's 0.015%. Uh, uh, okay, so these were the two different worlds, right? Assuming it was homozygous, we had one probability. Assuming it was heterozygous, we had, we had another probability, okay? We know that um, in, uh, in reality, mm -hmm. for... and, yeah? And, and we uh, didn't consider the a possibility of error in the first uh, example because the magnitudes are so different. Yeah, well, so, um, uh, no, it, it, it was to, to make the math simpler. It was to make the math simpler, yeah. So it, it's, it would have been much smaller, so, but then it becomes this conditional. So is it different due to it's being homozygous or do we have back, um, does the allele change due to an error or due to we have sampled the other allele? So it's, it's, uh, it's easy to write down in, in math, but it just becomes the sum of these conditional probabilities. But it doesn't matter for this example, as you're saying, because they are so small. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So if we know that in the background population, in a, in a, in a human population, you have one heterozygous sites per, per 1,000 base pairs, okay? So this is the information we have, and we can try to come up with these kind of mixture distribution of what is uh, most likely. That is not the, the way we are solving this uh, problem. Right? It, it's not easy, it's not, a, it's not tangible to, to, to solve, I would say. So what we do is that let's not try to do a hard call of 
the, the, the genotype. Let, let, let's not do that, but let's try to calculate a sort of probability measure for the different possible genotypes. Okay. If you have uh, an alphabet of four uh, letters, A, C, D, and T, and we do not care about the ordering, then we have 10 possible uh, genotypes. Okay, so it can be either A, 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 C, A, G, or T. This is like in a matrix where we have lower, uh, where we remove the lower triangle. Okay, so for the basis from our example from here, here we are having the, um, the, 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 the sequence basis. And in this example, for each of these bases, we have these quality scores. Okay, then we want to take this information we have here and put into a sort of probability measure for these different uh, genotypes. Okay, this is what we want to do. This is the goal. We want to uh, we want to take our sequencing data, all the information from the sequencing data, and define some kind of probability measure for the possible uh, unobserved uh, genotypes. Okay, so. A human is deployed, one chromosome from the father and for the mother, but uh, something like the mitochondrial, this is a uh, haploid, okay? Haploid means, means one fold. So if you don't have a chromosome from your father and your mother, th then it's haploid. That would be a single chromosome. In the most uh, easy to explain genotype likelihood model, because that, that, when I say we, we should invent that, uh, a probability measure, there are many different probability measures that tries to model the uh, problems with the data in different ways. The most basic one is the ones that implement in the software called GATK or GATK. Here they are assuming that the, it's a deployed individual and that the quality scores are correct. So this would be the, the canonical, the direct approach if we assume that the, the quality scores was not associated themselves with, with errors, right? So this becomes a bit meta. We have um, the quality scores which talks about the, uh, the uncertainty of the cold basis, but the quality scores themselves might be subject to uh, some kind of uncertainty, okay? So it's, it's, uh, it becomes a bit uh, confusing, but what the GATK model does, those, it assumes that the quality scores are correct. So, and if you're looking at a diploid individual, then this is actually the, um, the haploid genotype likelihood, this is, another haploid genotype likelihood. So the diploid genotype likelihood just becomes the sum of these for the two different uh, alleles that you have in a, in a haploid context. As an example, to make this a bit easier because it is a bit confusing, I know this and it, 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 it's also late. I, I made a full example, so this will be uh, easier to, uh, to, to understand. Assume we have a read with a specific base at T like thymine, the nucleotide T. This has a quality score 20. That would, would have been the ASCII value, uh, ASCII character five. Then we want to know what is the probability that it's, uh, that it's a T. If we do this, then we start out by taking our quality score and calculating the error probability. This is the probability that it's incorrect, okay? So the probability that it is indeed a T would be one minus our error probability. So that's 0 0.99. On the other hand, what is the probability that it's uh, not a T? There are three different options here. It's a A or a C or a G. We assume that these are equally likely, okay? We assume that these are equally likely. So we have 1% error and we just distribute those among the three remaining. So this is the assumption that we are doing here. So this is of, of course an, an assumption which is, we know it's not correct, right? We are, we've just looked at the damage patterns for, for ancient DNA. We can see that there's a discrepancy between the, the we observe an A, so should it be at C, right? So, so this uh, one third that we are just distributing among the, the remaining is, is not correct, but this is the assumption in the GATK model. Okay, so this will give us the, um, this will give us this value here. If we were looking at, um, if we want to calculate the gene type likelihood for a haploid individual, then we could forget this part here 
and then we would just calculate all these probabilities for the for the single basis for all the different reads and then we would take the product because we are assuming that the reads are independent you're assuming the reads are independent this is another assumption we are doing there very much like you're not being dependent error rates might be correlated in a region and it has to do with how we are mapping things. So there are many, many covariates that goes into this. But so, but as long as we know what the assumptions are, then we can try to improve it later on. Okay. So here there was supposed to be a, another small exercise where you were asked to go through, uh, go through exactly the same uh, example here, but given the time, um, uh, I, I won't, uh, we shouldn't do this. Hopefully, it, it was clear from the uh, from the context. So this would, if this had been a, like a, a pre-corona class exercise, this would have been a take-home uh, exercise. Then you would have been given these uh, bases and these uh, uh, ASCII characters, and then you would have been asked to uh, to calculate the the genotype likelihoods. I'll go through two of these so uh, it's clear. We are observing a T. This has the, core, the ASCII character plus. This corresponds to a quality score of 10. This corresponds to an error rate of 0 0.1. Okay, we observed the T. So the probability that it's a T is one minus this error probability. Okay, so the probability that it's, a, that it's not a T, either C or D or A is just one third of this 0 0.1 is what we're seeing here. The next example here is that we are having a C, we are observing a C, this is our base, our nucleotide cytosine. This has the, the, the quality score in ASCII comma, we look up an ASCII table and then we find that this corresponds to the ASCII value of 11, okay? We put this through into this uh, FRED scaling and then we get an, an error rate of, uh, of, of 8%. So we observed a C. So the probability that it's a T is one third of 8%, which is roughly 2.6%. Uh, we observed a C. So the probability that it is a C is just our one minus our error probability, 0 0.92, uh, 8%, uh, the, uh, one minus 8%, uh, right? So, and this probability is due to symmetry, the same as this probability. And you can go through all these here. And then to get the overall genotype likelihood for this example, T and C, then you would take the, 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 the product, okay? And as it turns out with many, many likelihoods, these uh, become incredibly small. So we normally just use the, the, the log scale. And in this example, with these uh, ASCII values and these observed bases, then we get uh, the log scale genotype likelihoods to have these values. Just as our intuition says, the, we, we have very, very low probability of observing an, an AA genotype because we didn't observe any, any, any AA genotype. But of course, it's measured with some kind of probability when we are calculating this probability measure. There's a much higher probability that the genotype has to do with, uh, with a T because we actually observed the T. But uh, the two only relevant uh, genotypes uh, that could be considered for, for, for this observed data would be the uh, CT and the, the TT. Okay, so if this was in log scale, so you could see all the values. If we flip this into, um, into normal, scale, right, we just take the exponential, then uh, we get that uh, the CT has a much higher likelihood than the T, okay? Okay, so I had hoped to talk about genotype calling, but uh, we, I'll, we'll start out the, the, the next session with this. So this will be the, the final slide. Here in the calculation of the genotype likelihoods, I already talked about all these assumptions and there, there are many, many methods for calculating these uh, probability measures and these take into account different aspects of the data. Get K, even though it's uh, not the, uh, the oldest method, it's, uh, it's the one that, that does the least modeling. 
And the assumption and, and why they don't do this is that they are assuming in there, it's, it's a software tool called KHK, is that they are trying to, before they are, they are calculating the genotype likelihoods, then they're trying to recalibrate um, the quality scores. So they, are, they should be more correct than if you use the raw ones from the sequencing machine. Then there's some, the, uh, there's a model in SAM tools, or BCF tools, uh, more likely these days. This is using uh, the quality scores, of course, and it tries to model the, uh, the, the errors. It assumes that the second error you observe comes with a different probability than the first error you observe. There's something which was implemented in the SOAP SNP, which is, um, it actually does a recalibration also. I wouldn't say SAM tool does a recalibration. So it tries to, to modify the, the quality of your data, if it becomes, um, if there's a systematic bias, it might be that for uh, for position eight, when you're sequencing, you have a tendency to uh, observe uh, Cs with a specific uh, probability of error, right? We would assume that if you look over the read, everything should have the same probability of, of, uh, of error according to, um, to the mismatch rate. So, 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 so SNP does this uh, error modeling and it's position specific, which is different from SAM tools. Then there's a method uh, from 2010 from, the, from, from Suyong Kim, which is uh, calculating and estimating the type specific errors. So this one is trying to, uh, to calculate the, uh, the, we are observing a T, but that was in reality a C and it's not using the quality scores. Most re recently and most relevant for, uh, for ancient data, is the method from, uh, from the Daniel Wegman lab in Switzerland, Vivian Link. It's implemented in the, uh, in the Atlas software. This estimates type specific errors and these are position dependent. So these should uh, model uh, deamination. So we had these uh, da map damage plots, if you remember those where C turns into a T in the beginning. So this is what this genotype likelihood model should, uh, should cover. Or, or take into account and, and correct for this. Okay, so I think we should stop now here. It's uh, one minute past uh, past six in, in Copenhagen. So uh, I'm assuming it's somewhat later at, in, in Moscow. Is there any questions? Well, today the audience is really, really quiet. Yes, I wonder why is that the case? I guess because most of the active students left for some reason, maybe mm -hmm. they were from the same group and had to do their homework, like Zemir mentioned, or something. I don't actually know. Okay. Actually, I'm sure that Vladimir will have a serious talk with those who <laughs> were present and didn't say anything. Okay. <laughs> I am kidding, of course. Okay, so I'm wondering, was it the uh, Ross that was too rough on them last week? Was that the case? Um, mm. I don't know. No, she okay, wasn't, I think. Uh, okay, super. Okay, so the, the slide. Oh, uh, yeah? There is one question uh, in the Zoom chat. Okay, um, let me find it. Why we assume the terrors are equivalent? Uh, I'm trying to hear the chat. Um, uh, so uh, I. I guess that question has to do with uh, with this part here, with the one third, and that is uh, the assumption in in this genotype likelihood model, which is uh, which is uh, of course not correct, but but it, it is the the assumptions that, that we have here. It would be uh, you would need to know more about the um, the organism that you are analyzing if you wanted to put a more correct value because the, this transition and transversion uh, ratio is different between the uh, organisms, I assume. So this is uh, the, the most basic uh, approach for calculating this uh, probability measure. And it is that we are assuming that the reads are independent. We are assuming that uh, all bases are equally likely with regards to, uh, to errors. And we assume that the errors are not uh, correlated. And these are the, um, 
are the uh, the assumptions that some of the other genotype likelihood models are are, are not assuming. Mm. Mm. Yes, I can see here. Well, well, actually, there's ethical issues should not influence scientific uh, research. That's a uh, that's a valid point. I think it's uh, it's something. Uh, it's a viewpoint that many people uh, within uh, the hard science uh, uh, agrees with. At the, the Lundbeck Center for Geogenetics, where I am, we are always trying to reach out to, uh, to archaeologists and to anthropologists and, and to linguists in order to avoid, uh, to, to, in order to get the full picture. And if you are uh, listening to uh, to other people, uh, to, to the concerns they have, it's um, I, I don't necessarily see it as a hindrance with regards to uh, to the science. It's it's a matter of uh, I think it sounds a bit heapy, right? But it's uh, it's a matter of just understanding the viewpoint. You you might not uh, agree and you might disagree, but just understanding why other people uh, have feel this and have this way of thinking is, is, is very uh, invaluable, I think. Yeah, so are there other questions? If you have other questions for, uh, uh, for, for next week, we can start out with that. And I'll for, for the next session, there won't be another uh, uh, recapitulation of uh, the ancient DNA. We, we are done with that. That was just like a brief introduction that uh, I think most people uh, haven't heard about and find very uh, interesting, like popular science. So what we'll do the next time, I'll start to talk about genotype calling, how this is done in practice. You can look at the slides for the next time if you want. I'll talk a bit about uh, a real frequency estimation on the basis of genotype likelihoods. And I don't really think we'll go in through, uh, into anything with, uh, with, with association. I might also talk a bit about the, uh, the EM algorithm because that's used uh, extensively. And that is a way of uh, estimating parameters from a, a statistical model where you have latent variables. So that could be, uh, I'll, I won't go into the, the nasty gory details, but I will hopefully, She'll give you an intuition about how this is being used in many, many of the optimizations problems we have in when we're doing these kind of methods. We, we end up using the EM algorithms, which is uh, can, can be very useful as soon as you have an, some kind of intuition about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Torfin. Good. Thank you. Good. So I uh, see you next uh, Thursday in a week from now. Yeah. Okay. See you in a week. Yeah. Goodbye. I guess. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for visiting. <laughs>